Niste? Eh för sent då du noll pint. Det här går inte. Får gå långt in där. In this video we will discuss the topic of body weight in endurance sports and we will clear up some misconceptions. Let's get straight into it. You have probably heard the statement to become a world-class cross-country skier in distance races, a maximal oxygen uptake of 80 milliliters slash kg slash min is required. There is some truth to this statement, and capacity is definitely important. However, this quote is a bit unvarnished, and the problem with this statement is, it doesn't take into consideration the weight of the athlete. When someone says something like this, it sounds like 80 means the same regardless of body weight. This is not the case. There are often two different ways to measure physical capacity. You have the relative numbers which are dependent on the body weight, and you have the absolute numbers irrespective of the weight. For example, in cycling, they use power meters to measure their energy outputs or external loads. A cyclist who weighs 65 kilos and rides at an absolute power of 350 watts has a relative power output of 5.38 watts per kilo. A cross-country skier who weighs 75 kilograms who has a maximal oxygen consumption of 75, has an absolute VO2 consumption of 5.625 liters per minute. Different types of terrains will require more of one or the other. In uphills, the requirement of relative power is high, while in flat terrain, the requirement of absolute power is more significant. However, there are no types of terrain 100% determined by absolute or 100% determined by relative numbers. There will always be a mix, and both will influence the speed in all types of terrain. So even though absolute numbers matter more than relative numbers on the flats, it doesn't mean the relative numbers are totally irrelevant. It may be about an 80 to 20 percentage wise ratio. In uphills, it will be the opposite. When ascending, the relative power of course matter way more than the absolute numbers, but it doesn't mean the absolute energy outputs are irrelevant. Depending on the degree of incline, the requirement of these two will vary but it's never fully one or the other. In a sport like cross-country skiing, where you have to overcome both uphills, downhills, and flats, it's in no way just a sport determined by relative terms. So, talking about the digit of 80 without any context will be unvarnished and a gross simplification, because 80 is a relative term. Cross-country skiing isn't only about steep, long, and constant uphills. Competitions like Lisa Botten and the last stage of Tour de Ski are not representative of the sport. That's why you'll see some featherweights shine only once or twice a year, in just those two races. If there were more of these competitions, you would have had other skiers dominating the sport than what we see today. Furthermore, the digit of 80 doesn't mean the same regardless of body weight. If two people both have a relative VO2 max of 80, but person A weighs 60 kilos and person B weighs 80 kilos, the 80 kilo person will travel faster everywhere, even in the uphills because the absolute energy outputs will be so much greater. A practical example to illustrate this could be cycling. Wout van Aert weighs almost 80 kilograms, but he is still able to climb ridiculously fast despite his watts per kilo on paper, indicating him having no chance against lighter riders. On the flats, bigger riders will in general be faster than smaller riders. Filippo Ganna is another good example. In a cycling context, he is a super heavy weight with his 83 kilograms. This guy is almost unbeatable in flat terrain, thanks to his inhuman absolute energy outputs. Watts per kilo will therefore not tell the full story, and it's the same for cross-country skiing. Heavier skiers might have lower relative power outputs, but it doesn't mean they will be slower because, one, a big part of the competition is not uphill and having more absolute power is an advantage in these types of terrain. Two, at the same relative VO2 consumption or power output, a heavier athlete will go faster everywhere, including uphill. Do you know Juha Mieto? He is known for being the heaviest professional cross-country skier ever. He was 6'5 and a half or 197 centimeters and weighed over 100 kilograms or 220 pounds when he was active. According to the internet, he had a relative VO2 max of only 73 when he was at his peak. How is it then possible to win the 50 kilometer in Holman Collin and beat competitors with relative numbers from 85 and above? This says enough about how important absolute power is. His absolute VO2 was the highest in history, by the way. 
Mieto is of course an exception, and claiming 100 kilo is the ideal weight for cross-country skiing is of course ridiculous, but that he even managed to be relevant at the world level says enough. In the other end of the spectrum, there are youths and children who have tested super high relative VO2 while still being slow. In many cases, this is also due to lack of technical skills, but a big part of the explanation is the low absolute outputs. If you weigh 40 kilos, having a VO2 max of 80 would not have been enough to compete against elite male seniors, because the absolute number would still only have been 3.2 liters, while most elite seniors have between 6 and 7. So yes, the relative VO2 is of importance, but it's also about where you are on that scale. The heavier you are, the faster you will travel at the same relative number, and it's also much more impressive to have a certain relative output. It's the same thing with power and cycling. 6 watts per kilo is much more impressive and will be way faster if you're 70 kilos than if you're 50 kilos. This is obvious in time trials. Super small riders tend to struggle on the flats. At 6 watts per kilo, a 50 kilo rider would only be riding at 300 watts, while the 70 kilo rider would be putting 420 watts into his pedals. At the same relative number, you got a massive 120 watts difference. It's the same principles in cross-country skiing. Realistically, it's very hard to win races if you are really small and you have incredible watts per kilo but very poor watts, but at the same time, it's also really hard to win races if you have incredible power, but very poor watts per kilo. Let's imagine a guy weighing 150 kilos. Even if had the craziest absolute power ever, as soon as he hit a little bit of incline, he would just get gassed out, and it would have been impossible for him to keep up. The extremes show us why being within normal size ranges is ideal. Next, most uphills in skiing are not very long, and contributions from the anaerobic energy system are also important in these short and punchy climbs. Anaerobic capacity is often closely related to muscle mass, which means more muscular people are more billed for shorter climbs than longer climbs. In long, constant uphills, being light is definitely an advantage. Only a moron will deny this fact. But the point is, how many competitions are actually this format? Only the two races mentioned. Have you watched my video, Top Greatest Cross Country Skiers Ever? This is a video which ranks the best male skiers of all time. How many of these 20 guys are actually featherweights? There are only two of them, Simon Hegstad Kruger and Shur Rada. Both of them are below 65 kilos. The 18 remaining guys are either normal sized or heavy athletes. Kelowna and Sunby are short, but densely built with quality mass. More muscle mass will lead to higher absolute outputs, partly because of an increase in blood volume. Increased blood volume leads to increased VO2 consumption, which again leads to increased power. Muscular guys will therefore have an advantage in flat terrain. It's not because they're stronger, but as explained, more muscle will indirectly lead to higher absolute oxygen uptake, and therefore higher absolute energy outputs, because these two parameters correlate. Taller athletes have higher absolute numbers, both because of a higher total muscle mass and also because of a bigger heart with larger cross-sectional area. The heart size is proportional to the person's size. The message to get across here is that some people believe the shorter, the better, and the lighter, the better. This isn't necessarily the case, and different sized athletes will have advantages in different types of terrains. The start and the end of the race are in the same place. Brilliant cross-country skiers come in all shapes and sizes, and what you need to focus on is how you can maximize your potential. And don't worry like, I can't become a fast cross-country skier because I am too muscular or I am too short, too tall, too skinny, etc. Champions are physically and body type-wise built in many different ways. The point of this video is not to claim weight doesn't matter at all, but to shed light in a nuanced way on the fact that there aren't only disadvantages to being bigger, but also certain advantages. What we are talking about here is comparisons between athletes at relatively similar body fat levels. Excess levels of body fat will of course be inhibiting regardless of your frame and structure. You can find athletes in all shapes and sizes, but there is of course no one who is overweight at the world level, so don't misunderstand this statement. Excessive amounts of body fat will not generate any power and will just drag your performance down and every right-minded person probably understands this. Just because high-level skiers vary in body type, 
doesn't mean everyone can be the best in the world either. Genetics have a huge impact on sports performance. Not everyone has the genetics to become world champion, but this has more to do with other components like, for example, the response or lack of response to training, lack of neuromuscular control and coordination, good or bad anatomy and biomechanics, not ideal distribution between slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers and so on. For example, if you have a too high proportion of fast twitch muscle fibers, like you're built to run 100 meter faster than everyone else, it will most likely be physically impossible to become a world champion in 50 kilometer. Genetics matter to the highest degree, but you will find people with good genetics in all shapes and sizes, and you will find bad genetics in all shapes and sizes. The structural size of the skier isn't that important, but other genetic variables definitely are. To sum it up, relative numbers won't tell the full story, and the absolute numbers are of higher importance than what most people think. Using a given digit measured in relative terms without further context indicates a lack of knowledge of physiology. A certain relative power number doesn't mean the same regardless of size, and cross-country skiing is a sport determined by a mix between relative and absolute power outputs. More muscle isn't necessarily negative for performance. Hopefully this was clarifying. Make sure to like this video, share it, and subscribe. Men monsterbakken er så spesielt at det er ikke representativt for sporten.